But I'm going to talk today about data products. And so hopefully it's an interesting perspective for those of you who spend your time in the weeds writing code, those of you who are thinking about the business implications of data, because product is what ties this all together. Um, and it's also a lot of fun. So we get to, uh, to imagine a future, imagine uh, you know, what we can actually do with this data once we get all the details in place, um, and to think about what that future might look like and how we're going to build it. Um, and so in this talk, I'm going to start with the basics, which is really defining what the heck is a data product anyway. And the reason we have to do this is because in this room, we're going to have as many definitions as we have people. Um, if we were to go around and have everyone spout off what they think it is, it's going to be something different. If you ask investors, it's something else. Um, and so it's useful to sort of set some terms, to have a, a good uh, shared vocabulary and set of definitions. And so, for example, I know that um, there are certain words that mean some things to some people and not to others. So I'm sure we have in this room people who use the phrase data lake unironically every day. And we have people who come from startups who are like, why is it a lake? You know, that doesn't really make sense. And so, so let's try and bring our cultures together. Um, on the good side, we're finally getting rid of big data. Um, maybe no one agrees with me on this one, but I've always found this term a little bit difficult um, because it doesn't tell you how big uh, at all. And in fact, uh, even if you take an engineering point of view, how big, um, like big enough to require specialized infrastructure changes every day, pretty much. Um, so this one's going away, so you might think, okay, now we're free, we can actually speak clearly, but no, we have now AI, okay, um, or AI again. Um, and I do believe it used to mean something, and now perhaps it means something a little more vague. Um, so, okay, <laughs> you know, we, we still have to build things. Um, so where do we go from here? Uh, a very simple definition, data products are products that could not exist without the use of data in their creation. And I almost threw something in here about how it has to involve a cohort of analysis, not just a single person's data. Um, but then I thought there are enough pedants here that you're going to argue with me, and that would be like everything on Twitter, and really um, we don't need to go there. Uh, though maybe we do. You can tell me if you disagree. But they're products that you could not build without doing some analysis in the process of building them. It seems pretty simple, um, and when we think about it in the terms of analytics, the data product, data science, machine learning, AI, they're pretty much all the same as they apply to product. Um, so what makes a good one, really? I'm going to show you my favorite data product. It's Google Maps. Still my favorite. There are a lot of other really good ones out there. So what is remarkable about Google Maps? It is very boring, right? So anyone who grows up in Western society can look at this map and you know how to read it. So you can be driving in your car if that's the thing you do and uh, look at this map and it tells you how to make decisions to get somewhere. And you can make those decisions and use this data with no understanding of the underlying infrastructure behind this. So what's going on here is quite remarkable. There's real-time data being gathered from your phones. There's prediction going on to figure out you know, what the traffic was historically and what it's likely to be today. Um, there's a lot of computation here. You don't need to know anything about it to use this product. And yet, it could not exist without that computation. So it's a great data product. Another one I love is Google Photos. Um, just because you can go to the, the search page and search for things like, me in Austin with a cup of coffee, and it knows who you are, it knows what a cup of coffee is in the picture, and it knows, well, the metadata for location is a little easier, but we'll give them that one. Um, another great one is uh, recommendation systems. I mean, we use them all the time. They're responsible in many cases for significant profits um, for folks who do them well, and yet it's still not a solved problem. Um, there's a lot of uh, interesting work going on in recommendations. So another one is this old app called Dark Sky. Um, again, if you live somewhere with nice weather, maybe you don't care, but I live in New York City, and so Dark Sky sends me an alert when it's going to rain or snow like it did this morning. Okay, is everyone with me so far? Data products, they're pretty cool, they need data, great. Um, so it's 2017, why is this interesting now? So why should we be having this conversation today versus any of the many other conversations we could have? 
And I want to share one story, um, which is actually back from when I was chief scientist at Bitly, which is this social media analytics company. This is a real picture of my office at one point. Um, that is the little bub Yule log on the wall. If you need an hour of YouTube to just calm you down in the winter, it is the best thing. Uh, and that is a real puppy. Um, but this was uh, basically, we got a new Hadoop set up. This was years ago. We had to run a job to burn in the cluster. Um, and my coworker and I thought, OK, you know, wouldn't it be fun to see, given all this social media data, what people are sharing, what they're clicking on, um, you know, I like dogs, she likes cats. Which one do people share more on social media? And we realized, you know, the way you find a good question to ask often is to, to ask something until you have no good intuition for the answer and then try and uh, do some analysis to validate it. And so we did. We ran an eight-hour job over three years of social media data. This was including 80 million items shared per day, roughly. Um, this is a massive waste of energy. And the idea that we had computation po power so cheap that we could apply it to something so absolutely trivial really blew my mind. Um, and it turns out dogs win. So um, you may all hate me now, but dogs. Okay. All right. So, so there are two kinds of change that really matter here, right? So one is that you can't do something at all. It's not possible technically, and it becomes possible. And that's what we usually think of when we think about a technical breakthrough, even in data science. Um, but this other thing where you go from nothing to being able to do it so cheaply, you can apply it to completely frivolous exploratory work uh, is equally as important and it might even matter more. And that's where we are today with data products. So this is why it's important to have this conversation. And we see this changing in a bunch of different ways. So we have layers of abstraction that we can build on top of. So this is taking things that would take you, and here's a great example, right? Things that might have taken you weeks to do and make them take days or hours to do. Take things that took whole teams to do and make them things one person can do. And we see these increasing layers of abstraction. They're gaining more capabilities every year. If we look ahead, um, we can imagine that in well, in one year, we sort of know what the world will look like, but in five years, um, we will all have superpowers um, that today seem uh, like hugely expensive and burdensome. We're also starting to see new kinds of interfaces. There's a ton of work going on around unstructured data and use of unstructured data, particularly in natural language. Um, some of it is showing up in interfaces like chatbots. That's an interesting, um, interesting exploration but really in being able to make those new types of data sets useful. Um, and that includes both media data as well as text data and structured data. And finally, people are making more and more of their data useful. So a lot of, of people who run businesses are finally realizing, I have data sort of as a side effect of my business operations. It's the exhaust. And that data might be useful. And so when we say more data is becoming available um, within companies, it's not just things like, oh, we found out that sensors are really, really cheap and we can throw them in our products now, or whatever it may be. It's things like this, like we took our mainframe and we actually got the data out of it. You know, we have a client we work with that actually has living data from the 1800s and some of their current models. Um, and this is just as important. And I think it's pretty cool. Um, but having data is not useful unless you have the right problems to apply it to. And here's one of my favorite examples of what happens when you forget to have the right problem to apply it to, which is a couple of years ago, LEDs got really, really cheap. And again, you'll see I like dogs a lot. Um, and some folks went and created the disco LED outfit for dogs, and there's a fantastic video of a little dog walking around New York City wearing this outfit, and there's music, and everybody's very happy. Um, but maybe, maybe it was not the best, most focused, targeted use of this amazing technology. Maybe. I'm glad they did it, though. Um, maybe instead we look at applications where you have high value, and high value here means Either we currently pay a lot of money to do it, um, or it is, and or it is very, very important to do well. Um, and so this was a, a paper that came out January 25th 
Um, this is a task where we're looking not just at making radiology diagnosis much, much cheaper using deep learning techniques, but potentially giving access to high quality medicine to billions of people who would never have access to it. And so it is both that sort of zero to one and then all the way scale to a million. So first we think about automating the things we pay people to do, those are high value problems, and then we can think about what's next, how do we scale this, what are the new things that were never possible before. But it's not, I mean, I'm an optimist and a pragmatist, it's not that easy. Um, and so I thought in this, in this room, it is appropriate to talk through some of the current challenges uh, that lie ahead for those of us who want to build data products. Um, and there are a lot of them, unfortunately. So you can't buy these things. Um, and this is something that keeps coming up where, you know, um, I'm in a room with someone and they say, okay, you know, I see that someone's doing something like this. I want that and I just want to buy it from someone. I don't want to build it. I don't want to understand it. I don't want to get the data for it. Um, unfortunately, this doesn't work in our domain yet. And the reason why is that there is a generic formulation of the problem you want to solve. That is 10 times more complicated than the specific problem you want to solve, which means that as a data scientist, engineer, or business leader, the cost to solve your problem, it's possible and it's affordable if you have the right tools, the right people, and the right knowledge, and the right data in place. But to build a generic version of that solution that you can sell to everyone who has a problem in that class of problems is so much harder um, that it doesn't happen well. And so you end up with a lot of mediocre solutions, vendor solutions, um, and then a lot of missed opportunities. And that's a big problem in the data product world today. The other one is that it's kinda hard. Um, and it, it's really impolite to talk about anyone else's failures, so I'm gonna tell you about one of ours. Um, we had this brilliant idea where we were gonna um, take advantage of the number of pictures people take of their food, you know, post to Instagram and other public locations, and build a system um, using deep learning techniques to tell you whether the food, first we had the idea, okay, how many calories are in the food? Um, then we scaled it down and said, because the, the biggest trick for data scientists ever is if you can't solve the problem you wanna solve, find an adjacent problem that's much simpler that you can solve. So then we said, okay, we're not gonna identify calories, we're gonna say healthy or not healthy. It's at least, uh, it should be possible. Um, it turned out it was really not, and it wasn't because, because the, the idea was bad, I think. Um, it wasn't because the raw ingredients weren't there. But what happened was that we found out that all of the pages on the internet that tell you how many calories something has or how, much, how healthy something is disagree with each other. So I ate a lot of cheeseburgers, and it turns out a cheeseburger might have between 300 and 2,500 calories. And the data requirements for the model, um, it requires much cleaner data than that. And so we had to give up on this one. Um, though about a month after we did it, this press release came out. It's only a press release though, so I don't know if it's a real thing yet. Um, probably because they would have run into the same problem we did, though I, I like to think so. I'm sharing this slide to show you that it wasn't really a bad idea in the beginning. It's a good idea. Someone else did it. Just one month before it's time, maybe. Another thing that happens are unpredictable edge cases, and these can have very severe consequences, particularly for folks working in um, either in regulated industries or in areas where the, the data product impacts health and well-being. Um, and so to give an example here, this is a thing we built that, again, using the deep learning s system, takes your uh, Instagram photos and says, okay, here are things you like to take pictures of. It's called pictograph.us, you can check it out if you like. Um, this is more a demonstration of how these types of algorithms work than a real tool. Uh, and this is for an account called Bleaker Burger. They take pictures of burgers. I love it. But if you really drill into their account, there's this whole section called crabs. And if you look at it, you realize that everything it thinks is a crab is actually french fries next to water. Um, <laughs> There are no actual crabs here. And this one, you know, you can kind of get why that would happen as an intelligent, creative human observer. 
I had another issue where, um, again, I live in New York and I take a lot of pictures of the New York City subway. I guess I'm bored waiting for the train. And uh, my result from Pictograph came back and told me I like to take pictures of correctional institutions and prisons <laughs> because we didn't have the subway in our training set at all. Um, and the closest thing in the training set was this prison data. Um, and so this is, again, examples of where things go wrong. And because these models are themselves not interpretable, there's no easy way to go, go in and edit and say, OK, you know, don't say the subway is a prison. Um, there, there's a big challenge there. And this becomes a big issue when uh, you, know, you are legally required to not discriminate in certain ways, but you can't explain why your model might be discriminating. Just something to think about. Um, another problem we see pretty often is that organizations are structurally not designed to build data products or even to do data science robustly. Um, and when they are designed to do it, they're all different. So if you go in, and work at pretty much any tech company in 2017, they will pretty much develop software the same way. Um, the details will be different, but there's this notion of sort of agile flow, there's sprints, there's um, you know, having a backlog or a queue, and uh, it works. Data science is a little bit different, and because software engineering is a much more established practice, it tends to get shoehorned into that particular practice without a lot of thought. Um, and sometimes that leads to a kind of failure that's not a technical failure, but one where the process around the technology development is not accommodating data science and its unique needs. Um, and so I, I would advocate if you need to name your data science process, just make it something a little bit different, call it something like an experimental development process. So you understand that there are different phases where you're researching, you're building models, you're productionizing models, um, you know, we can pick on Agile a bit. Um, it, they're the cool kids, so they can handle it. Um, you should always aim to find the simplest possible algorithm that will work at the scale you need to be at. Simplifies maintenance. Um, that's a pretty good rule of thumb. Have a plan for operationalization. That is where you build a model, you put it in production, so it's running against real data, maybe even in a real-time environment. Um, and then what happens? So the world changes, data drifts, your model might need to be retrained. Are you monitoring it? Do you even know when that happens? What is the quanti quantitative test mechanism you're using to understand when that has to happen? Is there a mechanism for getting data from the production service back into the training uh, of the model? Does that improve automatically or does it require somebody to drink a lot of coffee and like make it happen manually and then that person goes on vacation um, and weird things happen? And having worked on social media data, I can tell you weird things happen all the time. Um, this is something we need as a community to give a lot of thought to. And again, a lot of people are doing this really well, but there's no standard way to do it, and there's no one set of best practices. So right now, we're in the part of developing this as a community where we all sort of tell our stories and ideas. Um, but if you go from one company to another, you'll find this is done uh, really differently and we need more tools. Um, another thing I think is challenging for us is that um, user experience has not typically uh, been designed to work with data or data products or machine learning. Uh, and I think there is a whole new field of professionals out there who can think about user experience in the context of data products that is user experience in a world that is non-deterministic, that is probabilistic, where you don't know what the distributions coming out of your models might look like when you're designing the interface, where you're trying to give people a greater understanding of something through data as part of the product, but you don't know what that data is going to be. This is really hard. Again, there are a lot of people out there who are great at it, but it has to develop its own professional practice. Someone should write a book. All right, so for the end of this talk, I'm gonna share with you some of the technical things that are really exciting to us um, that I believe will underlie the next generation of data products. Um, and to do that, I'm gonna give you a little bit of context about what we do at Fast Forward Labs so you understand the perspective we have. Um, but this is the fun stuff. These are the new capabilities that we have um, that are a little bit ahead of where the rest of the world is today. 
Um, and so what we do at Fast Forward is sit between three communities. We sit between academic research where people are um, you know, working on algorithms and theory, uh, startups where people are trying to build uh, new innovative things, um, sometimes with new data science, sometimes with commodity technology, and enterprise, that is folks who have a business that they understand very well, a lot of domain expertise. They have data um, and they have resources and in many cases the drive and vision to invest in using their data to innovate. But for many reasons, you know, that's a, a tough process. And so we, we help those folks. Um, and it, it really surprised me a few years ago when I started working in this space to discover that there are actually huge opportunities uh, to build data products at these companies that you might think of as the evil empire. Really, there are no Avengers fans here. Is everybody that tired? Um, yeah. So here are a few topics I'm going to run through uh, pretty quickly, and I added a new one in as well. We just released this a couple of weeks ago. Um, but these are the types of things where we look uh, six months to two years out. We have a process where we uh, look at four things, which I'll run through very quickly. Um, and then out of that, sort of identify these capabilities that are emerging, but that are not yet wildly distributed. And so the first thing we look for is research activity or a breakthrough. A breakthrough might mean um, a paper written over here that can apply over there. It's not always a Eureka type breakthrough, but work that, um, that might enable new capabilities in a domain where it hasn't been applied yet. Uh, we look for a change in the economics of a technique. So, you know, we all know that you can take pretty much any computational metric, cost of CPUs, cost of GPUs, cost of storage, memory, um, and plot it, and you'll get something that's, you know, a fairly linear decline of some degree. Um, this is another example that I found on Twitter, so I don't have a citation, but this is the micro SD card on the left side. It's from 2004. It's 128 megabytes. On the right side, it's 2014. It's 128 gigabytes, right? So there are plenty of things we might want to do that are constrained by the cost, but you can look ahead and make a projection as to when it might be something you would be willing to invest in. You can look for commoditization. And so Hadoop itself is the classic example of commoditization in this space. Um, before Hadoop, you could read the MapReduce paper, you could get 12 of your best engineering friends together, and you could build a distributed compute infrastructure. After Hadoop, you could get two or three of your best systems administrator friends together and run the thing. Um, it was not the most friendly project in its younger years. And now, any of us can take our laptops here at a conference and spin up a cluster you know, with a couple of button pushes. Right? Um, and so this is that kind of going from not possible to possible, but then possible to cheap to use for frivolous things like figuring out whether you want to pet cats or dogs. And also new data becoming available really does change what you can possibly address. Um, and here I choose Wikipedia because it is the dirty secret of every data startup out there. Um, it's also the reason why so many different APIs are uh, in English versus other languages, because the Wikipedia data happens to be available in English. Uh, and finally, the Wikipedia page on data science cited the creation of the Wikipedia page on data science as a significant moment in the development of the field of data science, <laughs> which to me was like the most Wikipedia thing ever um, and merits it being here on the slide but new data becoming available. And there are still a few things in our community where there are not good public data sets available. So for example, um, speech to text data is something that a few companies have a lot of it and it's really good, but those of us who wanna work on it, um, there aren't really great public domain resources. So a few examples of things we think are pretty exciting, um, and this is the fun stuff, so natural language generation which is taking structured data and generating narrative or articles automatically. And so if you've heard about this, it's usually in a context like this because journalists get really freaked out about this um, because they think this is robots coming to take their jobs. And it is true that the Associated Press now has an automation editor, which is someone's actual job. And they've gone from writing, I believe, 300 stories on quarterly earnings reports to 3,000 which implies that there are people who actually want to read 3,000 stories on quarterly earnings reports, but it seems to be working for them. 
Um, we wrote a, a prototype of this that generates real estate advertisements. So to demonstrate how the technique works, we took 80,000 real estate listings in New York City. Um, it has structured data, so things like bedrooms, bathrooms, location, neighborhood, amenities. It has the unstructured narrative, so how the real estate agent wrote the advertisement for the property. So you can go ahead and put in your, your structured data, it'll write the narrative for you. It's things like, you know, unique two bedroom and one bath with chef's eat-in kitchen, and it's totally making this stuff up, but it is statistically what is likely to appear in such ads. And we learned a few interesting things. Um, as a, a side note here, one is that if a apartment is listed as cozy or small, it is 400 square feet smaller than the average. Um, also, if it is listed as big or spacious or grand, it is at the average or slightly below. So, it, <laughs> see, you guys get it. In doing this, you can find those little biases of real estate agents. Um, if they ever mention size, it's small, right? Um, we also applied this to a couple other domains in demo form, like writing restaurant reviews, but that was evil, so we put that one on the shelf. Um, what this is about is not writing articles automatically. Nobody is going to use this to generate the real estate advertisements, but for figuring out ways to make structured data uh, accessible. And so there are some people, they're rare, who love looking at numbers. There are some people, many of them in this room, who like looking at graphs or creating graphs or other visualizations. And then there, there are most people who like a sentence that says, here is the insight from this graph. You still have to do cognitive work for a graph. Um, this is what this data means, and these can be personalized. And so now we have folks who are using this to automate the generation of everything from regulatory filings to personalized reports on financial services investment portfolios. So you get a report of how your stocks are doing benchmarked against some cohort, um, to celebrity gossip, which it turns out is actually structured data. Again, Kim Kardashian wearing a sweater. It's, uh, there's JSON for it. Um, we live in a weird world. Um, summarization is another look at NLP. So this is applying deep learning to uh, essentially make text computable. Um, in our case, you know, we would take, we wrote a system that takes an article um, and it, it builds a summary. So there are really two ways to think about this problem. One is I have an article and I want a summary of this article. Um, in this case, it's extractive summarization. So first it parses out the article to make it readable. And then it goes ahead and pulls sentences out of the article that contain as a set the same information roughly contained in the full article. And you can run this on anything. It was trained on human authored summaries of news articles. So it works quite well on that. Um, we've been toying with the idea of doing one for technical documentation, uh, but haven't done that yet. There's another formulation of that problem um, using the same, same idea, but at a different scale, where you say, okay, I have 10,000 articles about the same thing. What are the clusters of points of view in these articles? And summarize each one for me. Um, and I like that because it, everybody understands summarizing one article, but it's something you could read the whole article if you wanted to. Um, but you couldn't read 10,000 articles, or in our case, we applied it to Amazon product reviews for things like dog toys. And believe me, you do not want to read five or 10,000 dog owner reviews of toys. Um, dog owners are very passionate. They say a lot of weird stuff. Maybe now you will go move it, read it. Um, what this is about is not strictly summarization as a capability, but rather the ability to, to make text a computable object. So to take any arbitrary sentence and map it to a vector that can be compared in a meaningful way to other sentences or documents or subsets of documents. Um, this is a capability that I think will uh, show up in more and more places over the next couple of years, and we're just beginning to see it out in the wild. And what we just did is on probabilistic programming, and for that, uh, you sort of have to change the way you think about the world. So these other things require fairly large, fairly clean data sets, um, which are sometimes hard to access. Uh, this one is the opposite. So it requires domain knowledge. So someone who's actually an expert, um, small or messy data, it doesn't matter, multiple data sets, whatever you can get your hands on that might be informative, and you combine these things Bayesian inference with probabilistic programming languages to make it easy, 
um, to get a prediction of what the future looks like. But that prediction is not a single number, it's a distribution, and there are robust confidence intervals on that distribution. And so this is a technique where instead of having a black box deep learning model say, here's a score for you know, how likely your french fries are to be a crab, what you're getting is here's some information about the world that I've taken from understanding your prior beliefs about the world and adding in this data that we have access to. And so these are powerful techniques for helping people make real decisions. Um, and what's new and interesting here are the tools that are propping up where these distributions are a first-class data type. Um, so, so it's pretty cool stuff. The old sales pitch used to be, could be Nate Silver and five lines of code, but I don't think anyone wants that anymore, so we have to figure out sort of uh, what, what you wanna be. Um, but it, it allows you to do fairly simple things like, again, real estate valuation um, by saying, you know, where will I be able to buy a property for a million dollars in New York? Yeah, it's really depressing, actually. <laughs> um, all right. So what this represents is tools for combining your domain knowledge with what data you have, whether it be you know, small, messy, a couple of different data sets, to really learn about the world to make better decisions as a human professional. Um, and I think it is important to point out that many of these data products, they're not really about necessarily about automating the human out of the system, but rather enhancing someone's ability to have the right information at the right time to make a better decision. So we've come to the end. Um, again, I know I'm pretty much the only thing between you and freedom after two days of intense intellectual work. Um, so I won't go on much longer, but we will have time for a couple of questions. Um, but this is just to say that uh, data products are really exciting, and I think they're really important because too often data science gets put in the, the it gets put under a cover. It's hidden. It's about charts and graphs and analytics, which is really great, but it's counting things. Um, this makes it this takes advantage of the capabilities that we have to actually change the way products are built, to change the user experience, to build things that just could not be built without those data science capabilities. Um, and so that's what I'm pretty excited about. I've been watching the field of data science um, grow over the last, I guess, eight years now. Um, and we've come along this evolution to the point where it is now uh, something that you need to have in pretty much um, any sort of product thinking or any sort of product process. So it's pretty exciting, and I do think we are really just at the beginning. And if we do it well, it's gonna be a lot of fun over the next eight years or so. So thank you very much. Um, it's awesome to be here, and we'll have a couple questions. Oh, and if anyone is too shy to ask their question here, uh, you can get in touch with me on Twitter at H. Mason, or this is not very legible on the slide, but it's Hillary at fastforwardlabs.com. And we have one right here. Uh, hi, uh, fantastic Hello. talk. Thank you very much. Um, so if I was an entrepreneur or a young data scientist who was feeling entrepreneurial, I'd be pretty terrified after your talk to get into the data product space. <laughs> that is the exact opposite of the intention <laughs> that but, I had. But the. The alternative, though, is that the services space still has a lot of room for opportunity. Um, and from your perspective, is there a point of inversion from when um, creating a data product company becomes less risky and more of an opportunity than creating a data sciences services company? Well, wow. So risk is something you will always take on, and creating a product company is always riskier than creating a services company, um, just because of the nature of how that business has to invest and scale. But I do think that if you look along which capabilities are being commoditized and where people are already investing money, there are plenty of opportunities for building a data product, um, but not all of them. And some of the companies that have been built lately around pure data science or machine learning capability without mapping to an actual real business problem are essentially APIs in search of users. Um, so it, it shouldn't scare you. They're both great businesses to run. And I actually run a business where we do a bit of both. Um, so I can tell you that you can also use one to, to build the other. 
Um, and I think there are a lot of folks here who do that. Um, but it, it really is important to have both the data science capability um, and the right business problem and domain expertise. And so if you look at companies that are doing this really well, there's a little startup called Agolo doing um, summarization on financial news because that's where people pay to consume the news. They could do it as easily on celebrity gossip, but I don't believe there's a market there. There's a company called Clarify that does deep learning for image recognition, and they've gone from an API to targeted products around different domains for this reason. So it's really about finding that right problem and the person maybe find a partner who has that experience and domain knowledge. But don't be scared. If you're a young entrepreneur, it's the time to give it a try. Uh, thank you, a great talk as well. Uh, so you made a statement about um, shoehorning software engineering, traditional uh, techniques with data science. What are some of your experiences in formulating cross-discipline teams like that? Yeah, so this is one that is always really controversial and also something that I've personally um, struggled with in my own work for, for a long time because the, agile, the book as it's written around agile software development assumes you are developing with commodity technology. It assumes you are building things that have, have essentially already been built before. And so the kinds of things you're typically building are you know, user management systems or whatever it is. Occasionally you run into situations where you have to debug something, you don't know what's wrong, and it's one of those really hairy things that only happens on Tuesday at three in the morning or whatever it may be. Um, but the process is designed around predictability. It is not designed around research. And data science is often this idea of, I have a question. I have, well, if you're doing it right, you have a question. You have a quantitative error metric for understanding when you have a successful solution to that question. And it's an important question. So you've established that when you start. But you could spend two days and suddenly you have a better idea of whether it's possible or not, or two weeks, or you know, two years in some cases, uh, without getting to something that works. And so when you think about the process, um, you always have this friction between that research phase and um, delivering on a schedule. And so it now falls on a sort of ad hoc basis to the team manager to balance these things, and good managers do this naturally. They know how to do it. But bad managers don't, and there are a lot more bad managers out there than good ones, so it ends up being a problem. Um, to answer the question around how you actually build teams um, that keep both in mind, it's really uh, just making space for that exploratory process and making sure that your data scientists don't fall down that rabbit hole where they're doing something they're really excited about, but it's not going anywhere useful. So I have a question. In the beginning of your talk, you were mentioning uh, Google Maps as a data product, and you said it's boring. Yes. But isn't it really successful because it's useful? Yes. But when I say it's useful, nobody laughs. Um, so <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what I mean. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Great talk, by the way. <laughs> Thank you.